It was a vision that inspired the Order, blessed by the Dark Queen. Her absence proved that the Order itself was formidable enough to dominate Ancelon. Let's talk about the Knights of Dekesis. Welcome to another Dragonlance Saga episode. My name is Adam, and today we're going to talk about the Knights of Tachesis. I'd like to take a moment and thank the members of the channel, and invite you to consider becoming a member by visiting the links in the description below. You can even pick up Dragonlance gaming materials using my affiliate link. I'm referencing the Knightly Orders of Ancelon Dragonlance Sourcebook, primarily for this information. If you feel I've left anything out or would like to clarify any points, please leave a comment below. One can argue that were it not for the code and the measure, and the Knights of Salamnia's insistence on following them, the Knights of Tachesis may never have formed. Until Arikin's imprisonment in the High Claris Tower, and his education by the Knights of Salamnia about their orders, no denizens of the Dark ever conceived of emulating the Knights' rigid structure. But it is an order just as disciplined that is required to not only defeat the orders of good in the world, but to maintain order and control afterward. A lesson learned all too well in the War of the Lance with the Dragon Armies. It's a well-known paradigm of evil in Kryn's history that evil feeds upon itself. It's the law of balance that allows evil to never overthrow good, which is required in the campaign setting, but is exactly what happens, with the consent of all the gods in the Summer of Chaos, no less. One may also argue that were it not for that godly consent to allow the Knights of Tachesis to dominate Kryn without objection, they would never have become the destructive order to all of Ancelon that they became in the Fifth Age and the War of Souls, the other side of that coin being chaos destroying all of Kryn. So perhaps we can leave that train of thought alone for this episode. After his imprisonment and earning the respect of the Knights of Salamnia, Arikin was released. The knights genuinely expected Arikin to petition to join their order, but instead, he sought to build his own knighthood that drew from the best aspects of the Knights of Salamnia while cutting away their failings. Arikin saw that the flaw in Tachesis' minions was selfishness. They were more concerned with personal gain than Tachesis' dominion, so Arikin decided to use a vision to guide his orders. He was visited by an aspect of Tachesis in the form of a dark warrior who ultimately supported Arikin's vision. She commanded him to begin immediately in her name. Arikin gathered the remaining forces of his fathers and called upon his mother, the goddess Zeboim, to raise him a secret base in which to build his forces from. She raised an island in the North Syrian Sea and, within a year, Storm's Keep was built. It maintained its secrecy due to the crosswinds of warmer northern waters and the frigid southern polar waters colliding, surrounding it in a perpetual fog. Not entirely unlike, yet still distinct from the Knights of Salamnia, the Knights of Tachesis are broken into three separate orders. The Knights of the Lily are the warrior caste of the knighthood. They are trained to fight in single combat on foot, mounted on horse, and even on dragonback. Their code is, independence breeds chaos, submit, and be strong. Knights of the Skull are the priestly order of the knighthood. They guide the knights through Tachesis' vision, placing each soldier within and presenting them with their valuable place in the vision. Their code is, death is patient. It flows both from without and from within. Be vigilant in all and skeptical of all. Knights of the Thorn are the magical arm of the knighthood. They use magic and divination to support the conquest. Their code is, one who follows the heart finds it will bleed. Feel nothing but victory. Together, the Dark Knights are formidable in combat. Arikin knew his Dark Paladins would not be sufficient to crush his enemies, so he sailed past the Blood Sea Isles and came upon Ithin Carthia and the Tarmac species, a massive, brutal people. Arikin won their respect, and they aligned with him to eventually invade Ancelon. Now with his Dark Knights, the Tarmac, the minions of the Dark, and an infantry of mercenaries, the Knights of Dekesis were unstoppable. 
Within a single month, they'd conquered more territory than the dragon armies had in the entire War of the Lands. Each new territory occupied brought with it fresh recruits. The whole of Ancelon, save for Sylvanesty, Northern Aragoth, Thorbarden, and small pockets of the Calchas dwarves were under his command. And then, the Summer of Chaos hit. The Dark Knights took the brunt of the attack of the Chaos minions, but they were augmented by every man, woman, and child of fighting age, as all of Kryn was fighting for their very survival. Over three-fourths of the knighthood and large portions of the commanding staff were lost, including Eric and himself in the Battle of the High Clarice Tower. This would have been a fitting conclusion to the knighthood, if it did in fact end there, as it was the birthplace of the Order. But it was not to be. Far from it, in fact, as Miriela Abrena took up the reins as the new Lord of Night, the commanding office of the Knights of Tachesis. As a knight of Tachesis was honored in the Tomb of the Last Heroes, Abrena in turn demanded land for their sacrifices. The knighthood no longer had their vision, and two of its orders were powerless with the absence of Kryn's gods in the Fifth Age. As Kelendros, the storm over Kryn, attacked the Tower of High Sorcery in Palanthus, the Dark Knights seized the opportunity to offer protection to Palanthus, which gave them a base of operations. Then, they made a deal with Kelendros to maintain control and collect tithing on his behalf. Abrena moved the seat of power to Naraka, as Storm's Keep was a prison for the Death Knight Lord Oster Krail. She made alliances with other dragon overlords, and even Gunther Uth Wistan offered to unite the Salamnic and Tachesis Knights, which Abrena agreed with initially, then went against. All the while, Tachesis was shifting influence in preparation for her return. Abrena had knights learn mysticism from the Citadel of Light and fabricate a new vision, a lie but a necessary one. An aspect of Tachesis, the Shadow Sorcerer, taught the knighthood primal sorcery, but as the decades passed, the members' honor and belief in the vision waned. Morham Targone assassinated Abrena and took over as Lord of the Night, running it as a business more than a knighthood. He renamed them the Knights of Naraka and moved the headquarters to Jellic. As he assaulted Sanction in an effort to collect its wealth from the Slamnic knighthood, Mina arrived in the wake of the great storm that swept across Kryn. With the power of the one god behind her, she won the soldiers over by her faith and miracles in the name of the one god. She captured Sylvanesty, occupied Salanthus, Quilinesty, and Sanction. She defeated the dragon overlord Malice at great cost, and as Tachesis was entering the world, the gods returned, and the new mortal Tachesis was killed by Sylvanoche. Mina exacted revenge and disappeared, abandoning her knighthood. In the years that followed, the knighthood splintered into warring factions and lost territory. Balthazar Reynold claimed the title of Lord of the Night and began unifying the fractured knighthood. Reynold moved the seat of the order back to Naraka and reintroduced honor to the knighthood, as he was a student of Arrigan's teachings. This meant a loss of knights, but a return to form. He maintains order with the secret police called Cabal of the Code, making those who speak out against him disappear. There's an onyx order that's focused on eliminating foreign enemies of the order, all in an attempt to to unite the many factions of knights spread all across Ancelon. And that is all the time I have to talk about the Knights of Tachesis. Do you think the Order is evenly balanced against the Knights of Salamnia? Would it exist without the Salamnic Knights? And finally, do you believe it has a future after the Dark Disciple trilogy in the Fifth Age? Leave a comment below. I'm able to create these weekly videos because of your attention and support. If you're not already a member of this YouTube channel, I'd like to invite you to consider becoming one. If you would like to pick up any edition of Dragonlance Gaming Materials, feel free to use my affiliate link in the description. This channel is all about celebrating the wonderful world of the Dragonlance Saga, and I hope you'll join me in the celebration. Thank you for watching. This has been Adam with Dragonlance Saga, and until next time, remember, bring order to our followers and they will accomplish. Discipline them, and they will achieve. Give them vision, and they will move forward towards a common goal.